is up, you guys? How's it going? I'm going to ask you all to move up since we're going to make this intimate. It's going to be us. Yeah, bring it up. Yeah, you guys are good. The blue chairs, just ignore the colors. Just come in. Come into the light. And then you know what we're going to do. We're going to trick more people into showing up. So when I count to three, you are all going to laugh really, really loudly. Like you are having the time of your life, like applause, laugh, yell, like whatever, OK? So we're going to just make them totally jealous if they decide to go to a workshop. Oh, this is awesome. This feels so much better already. OK, you guys ready for it? You ready to, to trick people and fool them? You ready to run a motorcycle? <laughs> Somebody's actually riding away. <laughs> um, OK, ready? One, two, three. so much fun over here you people that went to workshop in the near near oh they're actually coming oh people are running up here that's awesome um so thank you all uh thank you all for coming and this is my first time speaking in front of my dog she's uh she's done panel discussions with me before but this is a brand new territory i travel the world with her and so it'll be a good time uh, I mostly live in New York. I have a little strategy agency called Lux Digital. It's right there. And what we do is we say that we create measurable emotional resonance online. So anything that has a passion component to it, whether that's a social movement or a product, film, um, those are all the different kinds of things we work with. And we help organizations figure out how to use different technologies to accomplish their missions. This is going to be an operation. Oh, you can't see me behind the speakers, can you? <laughs> Sorry, wait, I'll, I'll get a good one for you. That'll be totally impromptu. Yes. Okay. Anyway, let's get going. I want to I wanna talk about. Um, uh, I'm going to take you on a little journey. We're going to go down an awkward, awkward road together. And I'm hoping that you come along with me for it. But first of all, let's find out where everybody's from. So who here in the audience um, is from or lives in Kosovo? Yes. All right, few people. Rest of Europe, where are you from? Yeah. Austria. Whoa, Austrian, you guys can hang out later. We can all Deutsch sprechen. They're super, ne? Germany, yay. Goodbye. North Americans. Up. Whoop, whoop, up. Global South. South Asia, South America. Ah, ah. Where are you from? Many places, she says. I'm a citizen of the world. Yes, Central America. Excellent. It's good to have you here. <laughs> Yay. All right, um, so you guys ready for an awkward journey together? Yes. Yes, they say. Um, so I was a pretty awkward kid growing up. That's me. Um, I'm 14 there. And I mostly did fine with my family or people that I knew really well, but I didn't really interact with peers all that well. Um, at each stage growing up, I would have one best friend at a time who would be the sort of social connection for me, who would, who would um, teach me how to have a social life. And my high school life was the horror story that it was for most uh, American kids, 95% or so, have horrible, horrible experiences. Um, and through that, through that kind of socialization, I learned that I didn't mind being on my own. Um, and I did, however, struggle with loneliness and isolation. And I didn't know at the time that those two things were very different things, that loneliness is actually different than being on your own automatically by default. So naturally, if you're awkward and you're a teenager, the really smart thing to do is to go live in a country where you don't speak the language. Um, that's what I did. I went to Germany when I was 17. I was an exchange student. And I lived with an amazing family who I'm actually on my way to visit 
uh, again, I visit them every year, and uh, right after I leave Kosovo. And um, going, though, to school on my own, not speaking the language of the other people, it, that was where I truly, truly experienced loneliness and isolation um, for the first time. And let me tell you, it sucked. It totally sucked. And I don't know what changed for me, but I think it was right around the time when the language started coming. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where you're learning a new language, but there's that moment where you uh, understand everything that's happening around you, but you still can't speak. And it's the most frustrating experience where you're sitting there and you're like, yeah, it's horrible. Anyway, um, one of the things that I realized is that I had this opportunity to create an entirely new version of myself, one that wasn't tied to all of this nerdy, awkward baggage that I had at home. I could become someone entirely new. And when I thought about um, creating this persona, I thought about, well, what do I actually want to be um, that, I, that I'm not now? And so I, I knew a couple of things. Uh, I knew that I wanted to be funny because being funny means that you can buffer all the mistakes that you're going to make culturally and socially and language-wise. Um, I also knew that I wanted to be badass because I love Thelma and Louise and I, you know, started smoking to hang out with the cool kids because that's what you do. Um, identify who they are and start smoking. I am a poster child for cigarette companies. Um, I also knew that I wanted to be artsy because that was actually more valued in my German school culture than it was in my culture at school at home, and I was a fairly artsy person. So this combo persona, a person, um, protected the, the very squishy and sensitive version of myself. It gave me space to breathe, and it let me try on a variety of masks as, as I struggled to be a fully formed human who was living 4,000 miles from home. So when I got home, and I didn't actually, it went from, wow, this totally sucks, to I don't want to leave this country and I don't want to go back. It was amazing. When I did go home, I discovered, dun, 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 the internet. It was 1994. It was amazing. And as much as it was about for me, you know, discovering that the world's knowledge was at my fingertips, even at that juncture, it felt like that. Uh, more importantly, I quickly found people Behind the web pages, um, there were humans that were lovingly creating these things and sharing them with the world. And then there was Usenet. Who remembers Usenet? Besides Bruce. Yes, Usenet. Who's still on Usenet? Who's still on Usenet because you got in trouble for BitTorrenting movies? Oh, sorry, that was just me. OK. Um, Usenet is, is, is user groups, is news groups um, about uh, uh, any kind of topic, and, and, and people were talking about all kinds of things. There were their obsessions with their favorite things in the world. There were political discussions, and yes, flaming was as much of a problem then, then it is, as it is now. And, but most importantly to me, people talked about their lives. I didn't know it then, but what having an inter internet connection meant for me was this chance to continue my squishy experimentation. My first internet friend was a woman that I met on the news group Alt Angst, and it's just as angsty as it sounds. And we traded poetry for years and talked about how our art uh, helped us manage some of the more challenging emotions that we would sometimes experience. Um, then I graduated internet-wise, I escalated. I went to IRC. Who my IRC peeps? Yes, IRC, Internet Relay Chat. Uh, giant chat rooms that were open to anybody. You could create channels for anything. Um, and I'm going to admit to you folks, this is the first time I'm publicly admitting this, so I really want you to be there for me, but I used to hang out on an IRC channel for fans of the Bare Naked Ladies. Yes, I did. If you lived in the Northeast uh, of the US or Eastern Canada in the early 90s, you loved this band. I want you all to admit it to where my North Americans at, yes. Anyway, we talked about tape trading and shows and stuff like that, but more importantly, we talked about our lives. Um, and when I was in college, I had a small, tight group of friends with whom I ran around, and I was popular and socially adept, mostly. Um, but the internet was still a place for me to feel safe without getting 
overstimulated by real live people or to feel pressure to perform this persona that I had created at all costs. I even attended my first meetup that year, 1996. A bunch of us from IRC met at a Bare Naked Ladies show in New York City. Um, my mom was all worried about axe murderers, so I took um, offline friends with me. Um, one of the things that I almost immediately realized upon seeing these people that were behind the avatars were that they weren't, that I wasn't meeting them in real life, but that the internet was real life. So as the internet's focus became more uh, commercialization of the web, um, and that was where things went. It became harder for a while, for me anyway, to find that connectivity with other people. And I could totally be one of those people now that is like super hipster and be like, oh my god, it was so much better back then before everybody knew about it. It was so amazing. I'm not going to be that person. Although the dot, dot, the dot com did kind of suck for a lot of reasons. But um, it's no different with internet generations. So when social media started to come out and really started to take hold culturally, um, it started to become easier to connect with people again. People and connections and relationships became the focus of these services and it felt so good to so many of us. One of the facets that I loved about early Twitter, for example, was this relative immediate um, intimacy that was created there. And it was a special combination of people that we knew and people that we didn't know um, creating this weird little bubble of community that thrived on authenticity and experimentation. We were making it up as we went along, and we all felt okay about that. It was this return to experimentation and authenticity that really struck me and excited me. Here were these wonderfully democratic tools that would allow millions of us to bypass these traditional gatekeepers of information and share our own stories and our own selves. And we had already seen with the blogging revolution how quickly that was going to change how broadcast and traditional media happened. Um, but many of us could also feel our own little revolutions happening within each relationship that we created on social media. We were experimenting with our public selves and to a great extent our private selves. Sharing these experiences and who we are online is a form of consciousness raising. So who knows what consciousness raising is? My feminists know what consciousness raising is. Um, anybody familiar with this term? I mean, other than just like it sounds cool. So this was a, something that got really popular in the, um, in the 70s and uh, late 60s and early 70s in Western feminism, where groups of women would get together and talk. And that sounds like a really normal, everyday thing to do, except at that time, with so many things that were happening, this is where the phrase, the personal is political, became really, really important. Because women started to realize that the injustices that they were suffering and the um, problems that they were facing, that they were not alone in facing these problems. They were not isolated. They were not um, crazy to think that there could be a better way to live. And they started to figure that out, that, that systemic injustice together. Isolation is key for keeping oppressive power structures in place. And connectivity, true connectivity, turns those power structures on their heads. And the same is true for what we're seeing in social media. When we share our stories with one another, we create these empathetic, uh, authentic experiences. And I always say that empathy is the foundation for social change because empathy is the opposite of apathy. One of my earliest personal experiences was um, with this particularly to social media and how this can create change was um, in 2009, which when I was writing this talk, I was like, oh my God, that's five years ago. That's so crazy. Uh, but there was a, I don't know if anybody heard about this here, but there was a pool in Philadelphia that belonged to a country club called the Valley Club pool, country club, and um, the, they decided that some kids who had actually paid for swimming privileges at their pool were not going to be allowed to swim that summer. Um, shockingly, those kids were mostly African American, 
And the uh, president of the country club, the leader of the country club, actually said um, that by having the kids there, they would change the complexion of the pool. Like, wow, like what, what century is it that A, it's okay to believe that, and B, to say it publicly, like this was totally amazing. And so a lot of activists got, you know, rightly outraged and they did the things that they're supposed to do. They, they created petitions and signed them and sent them around. They wrote letters to the editor. They blogged about it. They called and left mean voicemails on the, the country club voicemail. I remember that was happening. Um, and that was all great. We all did the right things. But there was this other undercurrent of empathetic storytelling that started to manifest specifically on Twitter. And what I saw there um, and what got started to get shared very widely and cross-pollinate across different communities were people of color sharing the stories of the first time that they remembered being a victim of racism or experiencing discrimination as children. And they were both heart-wrenching and gut-wrenching at the same time. One of the first ones that I remember, or one of the strongest ones that I remember, was uh, a friend of mine had, uh, was about six years old, she said, and another little girl that she played with in her neighborhood told her that she liked playing with her okay, but she would like her better if she put on her white skin in the morning instead of her brown skin. Six years old. Hits you in the gut. And you see these stories over and over and over. And by the grace and benefit of those people of color being willing to share their stories, I was changed. My activism around racial justice totally changed in an instant. No longer was it this abstract concept that yes, racism is bad. I had a personal, deep, emotional response to what structural racism in America continues to create um, in our story, in our culture. And I truly believe that storytelling can activate that empathy within us. And here's the cool nerdy part. Um, we're actually hardwired to empathize with one another. Did you know this about our, about our neurology? Dig this, who knows what mirror neurons are? <laughs> I'm gonna say it just every time I'm be like, except Bruce. <laughs> so mirror, a few people do, okay, so um, mirror neurons are subsets of motor neurons that activate whenever um, we see something happening to someone else. Our brains try to actually recreate the experience of what it's like um, for that person to be experiencing what, um, what they are uh, within our own bodies. And there's a really cool TED talk about this. If you go to TED and look up mirror neurons. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was a cool TED talk before TED was cool. No, just kidding. Um, so our brains, that means sort of neurologically, we are actually trying to empathize with one another all the time without even realizing it. And storytelling can activate that hard wiring. The trust that we create with one another when we share on social networks fuels this empathetic response. And that's what will lead us away again from the isolation and the apathy that we've experienced as a culture. And the siloing and separating of people, the stuff that Lee talked about with people as a mass and people as numbers. The, con the technologies are all about connecting and sharing and engaging. So isn't that amazing? Isn't the internet awesome? Ish, yes and no. Now for the not awesome part. Um, yes, it's awesome. It's coming. Uh, uh, part of the problem is that we're all a bunch of jerks on the internet. Um, especially you. No, I'm just kidding, not you. He's like. Um, but there are obvious jerks that are on the internet. We talk a lot about and spend a lot of time focusing on trolls, people who stalk, you know, people who harass. They get a lot of attention, and that's part of the problem because. They're like vampires of emotional violence that people can inflict on the internet. And that's one thing that I also want to make clear when we talk about these darker behaviors and darker subjects. People will often say to me, well, doesn't that reveal the dark side of technology? And I, say, and I always say, no, that reveals the dark side of humanity and technology is a tool with which this is being revealed. So. There's another kind of insidiousness that's developed online in the last few years. It's lurking everywhere. 
in the places that you least expect it. It is, dun dun dun, here comes the magic word, the culture of fossum. Something happened on the way to being awesome. It's tempting to blame this transition on pop culture or the young people or whatever, but it's much more complicated than that. As more and more people and companies, institutions, products and brands have joined social media, the content has obviously shifted. The party got much bigger and everyone is paying much more attention to these public selves that they are curating. I see much less of that experimentation that made the internet so interesting early on to me. Um, and I see less of the emotional risk that made the internet more than just a giant shopping mall for everyone. And because of that, the connections that we're making are starting to feel superficial. And a sense of isolation is returning for a lot of people, even though we're all more connected than ever. Fossum culture creates, contributes to this isolation. Sure, we're sharing a ton with one another, but what are we actually sharing and seeing? We're seeing you know, kittens and babies. That's awesome. That's great. Congratulations. You went on vacation. Everything is amazing and no one's happy. Do you know this bit from Louis C.K.? If you haven't seen it, go look this up, like not now while I'm talking, but later. And um, he kind of sums it up in a nutshell there. So occasionally you'll see stuff like people complaining about the weather. Chicago, I'm looking at you this past winter with your polar vortex. Um, but we'll also see things like, you know, somebody passed away, things that kind of generate a lot of attention. Um, we sometimes see Twitter fights and rants. We rarely see anything on Instagram that isn't annoyingly beautiful or at least meaningful in some way. But what's behind this schema is the stuff of real life, the challenging emotions, depression, mental health stuff isolation through self-selection outside of social activities because you don't feel good enough or well enough to participate in them. And the shame and the guilt that your life isn't as awesome as it seems like everyone else's is. This shallow attempt at happiness through connectivity has left behind some of the most important pieces of what it means to lead to deep bonding. In short, crappiness often leads to stronger relationships. And this is the key that we're missing about what makes social media social, that these are not just communications tools that we have. These are relationship management tools. And every relationship is a wonderfully complicated constellation of experiences. When represented digitally, it can feel fragmented and make us feel torn about what we share with whom. Fossum culture looks like this. Number one. Humble brags and fake gratitude. Yeah, they're down too. Oh, I made this one just for you guys today, so I'll read it to you. Uh, I'm so humbled and grateful to be hanging out with the president of the universe. She's pretty awesome in person. It's like, ah, oh, when people are sharing stuff like that, there's like that sneaky way of trying to share things of like, look how amazing my life is and I'm so humbled by it. Like, come on, please. Then there's the good life posts where you only see the good things that are happening in people's lives, like when they're on vacation and they're amazingly happy together and they're toasting their, their favorite drinks and all of this good stuff. And actually, even when I went um, looking for pictures that I could use and I found these little, this little Lego couple on the beach together, I was already like getting very New York and cynical. I'm like, I bet this is like a last ditch effort for their relationship and that they've gone on vacation together just to see if they could still make it work. And then, <laughs> this is the one that, that bothers me the most that I, I'm trying to navigate now, is um, happy algorithms of happy, particularly on Facebook, for example. So we learned earlier this year that Facebook uh, manipulated its algorithms to see if it could affect the emotions of its users. Uh, and if the emotions of its users would affect one another. Shockingly, that's true. And why would Facebook want to know this? Um, because if they're going to create an interesting space where lots of people come and hang out, they want to generally probably to have a super positive vibe. They're not going to want to share, uh, to promote a lot of the, the super crazy negative stuff. And, and that's understandable. Um, except that it all kind of comes back to capitalism, right? Like, yay, almighty dollar. 
don't forget, if you are not paying for the product, you are the product. So this is us at the hands of um, these kind of weird algorithms that are making people feel really bad about themselves because they just see good things. So this fosum veneer has created a more rigid and scary set of boundaries for what otherwise um, what otherwise may be connective and pathetic experiences. For example, I may not want my boss to know that I had a super crappy day at work, but by me needing to omit that from anything public or anything shared, um, it's not gonna clue people into my life just how much I hate my job. Different platforms and communities have tried to deal with this in different ways, which I find hilarious. Um, Google Plus, that old tumbleweed of a social network, Try to do it with circles. Who played around with Google Plus here? Yeah. Did you ever try to put all of your people into circles? Like every, yeah? Did you, did you ever then try to share sensitive information to, uh, with those based on who was in your circles? <laughs> did it make your head explode? What? It totally made my head explode. And, and, and actually that was one of the, the uh, some research that I read that was um, key for why it didn't catch on for a lot of people was because they had a really hard time quantifying and sort of tagging their relationships. Um, Facebook has a similar deal with its lists and uh, over on Twitter, users have kind of taken things into their own hands and created something, um, created communities that they call dark Twitter. Have you all heard about this? Yes. Don't, I, don't tell anybody this one. But basically what happens is that uh, users will create protected accounts where their tweets aren't public, their accounts aren't public and have no identifying information. And the only people that they'll share that with are people that they actually know who also have a protected account, who also have um, no identifying information associated with it and are not findable via email. And this leads to a really interesting sort of back channel conversation that happens in these uh, kind of larger cultural moments, um, especially when it comes to infighting within communities. So all that's great, um, but it certainly leaves a lot to be desired when it comes to emotional connection. And everything, every once in a while, something does break through this veneer of fossum, and it's almost always something to do with outrage and injustice. Right? Like that's the thing that, that catches on most quickly is when something really terrible has happened in the world. Um, one example that I actually really love is uh, the Aufschrei campaign, where my German speaker's at. Yes, you know Aufschrei. Aufschrei, natürlich, sagt er. So Aufschrei was a hashtag campaign in Germany last year that was sort of accidentally started by a friend of mine. And it was, Aufschrei means outcry in German. And it led to women sharing stories of sexism and harassment that they had experienced in their lives. And never before had German women publicly talked about this in this kind of volume and in this kind of way outside of the occasional you know, op-ed or protest demonstration somewhere. This was a very public space. Within the first 24 hours, there were 30,000 tweets with the Aufschrei hashtag, which considering that Twitter isn't super popular in Germany is ginormous. Um, that kind of conversation, again, leading to that, that empathetic connection or the horror of what's happening in the US right now in Ferguson, Missouri, um, in the wake of the shooting of Mike Brown, an unarmed young black man by a police officer, uh, sparking a tremendous amount of protest and outrage and leading to pictures like this that went, uh, went around the world last week. These are hundreds and hundreds of students at Howard University, a largely African-American university, holding their hands up in the international symbol for don't shoot, um, recognizing and conveying that any one of them could be a victim to this kind of crime because it is so pervasive in America, and sharing under the hashtag don't shoot and black lives matter. These moments can be catalysts for change and they spark our connectivity because we aren't preaching to one another in them. We see ourselves in each of these stories. We experiment and we risk our emotional selves when we share things that are profoundly terrifying or make us feel ashamed. And when we share those things, they can resonate and boomerang back. And when they hit, when that boomerang hits back, the shame 
it starts to creep away and the loneliness starts to drain just a little bit. I wish there were more chances to break through that it wasn't just outrage that lit, that lit this empathetic match. That we had the chance to experiment and risk safely ways of connecting emotionally that didn't, con that didn't violate our privacy or risk our wider public relationships. One of the reasons I wish personally for that deep connection, the one that I so desperately miss from hanging out on Usenet or early Twitter or other online spaces, is because this schism of fossilness has created um, a cut in me personally. For about three years, I had been on a downward spiral of burnout, accompanied by several physical health challenges. Part of that's because I'm an activist, and as activists, we all know, we all feel like our work is never done. And I'm also an artist, and you feel like a jerk if you're not contributing and producing uh, and giving back to the culture at all times, which is a pretty deadly combo. By midsummer of 2013, I was laying on my couch crying every day, almost entirely incapacitated and unable to imagine a future of feeling like this every day. At the same time, this kind of work that I do here requires me to maintain a fairly upbeat public persona. So I wasn't sharing anything about what was actually happening with me online. I was terrified of doing so. I thought that would mean a loss of client trust and income, uh, never mind that I had stopped being able to make money because I wasn't working. Um, but I finally did what I'd been putting off for 20 years. I started taking antidepressants and slowly my life came back together. So when I started to share this experience with just a few people here and there, I only shared it with a few people in the beginning because I was so ashamed about having to turn to medication to feel like a whole person every day. Um, I was given two main reactions. One was people would say, oh my God, I had no idea. I had no idea that this was happening to you. But to which I would say, like, how do you go on Facebook and be like, oh, can't get off the couch again. No big deal. I'm cool. Everything's fine. Don't worry, mom. You know, like, you can't do that. There isn't really a cultural space to do that. I also didn't really have the language to describe how I was feeling, which was exhausted and sad and frustrated. But that didn't even really cover anything of what was actually happening. And the second thing that people would say to me was, if this ever happens again, I'm here for you. You can reach out to me. Just call me, just pick up the phone. Which is the sweetest, most well-intentioned response that anyone can ever give, um, except that if you've ever been severely depressed, you know you can't do that. You can't actually pick up the phone. There's actually the, these studies that show this incredible um, drop-off in behaviors that show that if you're able to pick up the phone and call someone, you're likely able to get off the couch, get some work done, all that stuff. After that, everything just kind of all goes to crap. Um, so because of those responses, I started dreaming about a way to communicate the wholeness of our emotional lives. And because the universe is super magical, um, and so is Prozac, uh, I teamed up with uh, three people, Christopher and Jennifer Gandon Lee in Austin and Phoenix Schneider in Philadelphia to conceptualize what this service might look like. We're still very deep in development, but we've got this service called the Weather Report that I wanna to talk to you about very briefly. Now, obviously, I wanna talk about my new toy for a variety of reasons, but mostly I wanna share our thinking to get other people's gears going around the implications, the emotional implications of the nerdery that we have. Um, and that we're all working on. So briefly, the weather report consists of several sets of features with the following goals. One is a check-in for our emotional selves. It's designed for small, intimate networks. This is not a place where we want you to have 16,000 followers. We're trying to create a safer space for all different kinds of emotions, and especially the challenging ones. And by using the language and iconography of the weather, we want to give people a way to describe their emotions and help them learn emotional intelligence. We're using uh, these mechanisms for us to be emotionally aware of one another and to tune in to when someone might be in need and they might not even know it. And teach people how to meet that need. And hint, it's generally not saying things like, it'll get better, or you just need to try harder to be happy. <laughs> 
Lastly, we want to give people the ability to be a hero. One of the amazing things about anonymity on the internet, and we all hear about terrible things about anonymity, right? Like anonymous people do terrible things, not like anonymous the group, but like just people who are anonymous sometimes do terrible things, but they also actually do amazing things. And there's research that shows that on Tumblr, for example, in youth, when they post on Tumblr that they're not doing well, that they can't take it anymore, that they're having a really hard time and struggling. Oftentimes, they'll be uh, flooded with reblogs and comments and responses and messages that say, I'm here, I'm with you, I love you, I support you. So we have a hero system built into the weather report as well. Um, in the meantime, while we're getting going, I want to leave you with a couple of pieces of advice and a couple of things for y'all to think about. Um, as we all learn how to do backflips, because that looks amazing. Um, first of all, if you're a developer sitting out there, consider the emotional nuance of the apps and services that you are creating. Um, I think that's one of the last things that actually gets considered. When they made the like button, they didn't think about people dying and, and hitting the like button on that, you know? So consider some of the more emotional, squishy things that are going into. Uh, what you see. When you participate on social networks, just remember you actually have no idea what's going on with other people. And remember that that is the number one rule of the Fossum culture. You have no idea. We are all challenged in so many different ways that we have no um, concept of. When you see difficulties, don't automatically try to fix them. Just be there for the person. Um, that was uh, one. That was one thing when I was I was going through these these food intolerances as part of this, and I would post something like that I really missed ice cream, and every single time someone somewhere in my community would say, "Have you tried almond milk?" And I just wanted to be like, "F you! I miss ice cream. That's all I'm here to vent about." So when you see that stuff from other people, start with "I feel you. I'm with you. Or I'm here." One of my favorite things to do is just take the person's name and enclose it in parentheses and give them internet hugs. Just a simple gesture to let them know that they are not alone and that you see them. If you just can't stand not asking or not offering uh, help, ask first if the person is looking for advice and respect their answer. Uh, one other little nerdy neuroscience thing is that remember that flaming um, people back and forth is actually a biological response that we have. So we all know that body language and tone, for example, um, are very important to how we communicate. And that absence body language and tone, things can get a little hairy and confusing. But it turns out there's research that shows that those messages uh, that we receive digitally often goes straight to our amygdalas, which is the fight or flight place in our brains. <gasps> That's why we get flaming on the internet. So remember, take a deep breath. Probably not personal. They probably didn't mean it in a bad way. And you should not mean it in a bad way back at them. And lastly, if it's safe for you, be willing to share more of your nuanced emotional experiences. Help create a safer space for the people in your network. So that's it for me. Thank you for sharing this time with me. I just want you all to know that you are not alone either. And I'm here and we're all here together and I know that we will make revolution happen if we move with our hearts forward. So thank you. Thank you, Diana. Anyone has a question for Diana? <laughs>